Welcome to Smash or Pass Gran Turismo Edition, the mini-series where we review high-end cars in Gran Turismo 7 to arrive at the ultimate recommendation of Smash or Pass. I'm your host, GT Jesse, and I'm a data scientist by day and sim racing enthusiast by night. I developed a scoring algorithm to provide you, sim racers, an unbiased opinion on whether you should smash this car and spend your hard-earned credits, or pass on this one and save them for next time. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, please do hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and let me know in the comments below what car you want to see reviewed in the next installment of Smash or Pass. You guys, happy weekend. What is going on? I hope you guys have some great plans for this weekend. Hanging out with your family, hanging out with your friends, maybe kicking back, playing a little Gran Turismo, checking out this new update that Polyphony put out. Maybe you're watching your favorite YouTuber. Either way, I hope you guys are having a great weekend. I'm making this video on Friday. I think I'm gonna go on ahead and post it on Saturday morning. You can watch it while you're drinking your morning coffee. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Um, as you do watch the video if you're new to the channel hit that thumbs up button subscribe to the channel always appreciate it guys It's been a while since I posted a new video. I do apologize for that life's been crazy um, As you saw in my last video where we did the uh, roadster shop rampage um, I, I mentioned that you know I, I, We had just closed on our first house and before that there was you know I was living with family for just a little bit of time while we were in between and our lease expired uh, Well, we closed on the house and then like a, a week later we went on holiday and it was a long vacation, friends were getting married, and then uh, during the trip, we got COVID. And so, um, it wasn't a serious case, it, was, it really was, it was kind of like a bad cold. Um, you know, congestion and fever and ache, and, uh, but trust me, I'm still a little congested. You might be able to hear it, you might not. Most of it's gone, but um, I sounded like, you know, not to be a cliche, I sounded like a broken record. You couldn't, um, you know, like I would talk to people on video at work and they'd be like, oh my God, are you okay? Um, so, you know, not really in the best shape to be making YouTube videos, but I'm back, and uh, I'm back with a vengeance, guys. We are reviewing the Escudo Pikes Peak 1998 today. This car was just released in the most recent update that Polyphony put out for, for Gran Turismo 7, and I am really excited about this update and about this car and this review, because if you're anything like me and you've been playing Gran Turismo for a long time, this car has some serious nostalgia vibes. It's actually been in every single version of Gran Turismo since Gran Turismo 2, and uh, with the exception of Gran Turismo Sport, of course, we know we, did, we didn't have it in Sport, but um, it's been one of those cars that's just um, iconic. You know, everybody who's played Gran Turismo, they know what this car is, they know what it's capable of, and uh, you know, it's really, really a special car for me because when I was growing up, we didn't actually have a PlayStation. Uh, my family, we were Nintendo people, and so, uh, you know, we weren't one of those families that, like, had a lot of money and had, like, every single gaming system, so I had a Nintendo, my, my parents weren't going to buy me a PlayStation 2, and so I never, I didn't get to play this very much as a kid growing up. Um, the only times I really got to play it was actually when I would uh, visit with my family um, on holiday, and we'd go and we'd stay at my grandparents, and while we were there, uh, my cousin, who had a PlayStation, would bring it, and we'd play Gran Turismo. We'd have to sneak off upstairs and play it because my grandfather, he's one of those super old school guys. He's not going to have his grandkid, you know, running off playing video games all day when he could be doing chores. <laughs> so, you know, we'd have to sneak away and go upstairs and play this. And so when we did play it, we wanted to have fun. And because the Escudo Pikes Peak was one of the fastest car in, cars in the game, you could do speed glitches with it, um, you know, you could do wheelies with it. It was one of those cars that just brought the fun level to a whole nother level, if you will. And so, either way, I don't want to spend this whole video just rambling on my own personal anecdotes, but I am so excited for this car and to talk about it with you. We're going to spend a little bit of time here talking about its history in motorsport, um, and then we're going to go on ahead and jump into the review and overall rating for this car. Now, a little bit of history that I pulled off of the internet. The Pikes Peak International Hill Climb held each summer on the Pikes Peak Highway near Colorado Springs, USA, is the world's largest hill climb race. Um, it's also known as the Race to the Clouds, fun fact. It is a 20 kilometer course that rises 1,501 meters from 2,800 to 4,301 meters above sea level, featuring 156 corners ranging from highly technical 60 kilometer per hour hairpins to spectacular 200 kilometer per hour high speed corners. 
There's a temperature difference of 20 degrees Fahrenheit from starting point and the finish line, and the conditions are severe at best for the competition car. It's really interesting because this race actually, this, uh, this, this road, if you will, that the race takes place on, um, it actually was uh, all dirt until uh, the 90s when <clears throat> the, basically sections of the road started to get paved. Um, and it wasn't fully paved until 2011. And so up until 2011, you had kind of a, a hybrid race on dirt and tarmac. The cars had to be you know, very different then than they are now, where now it's a completely, um, completely paved track or course, if you will. Continuing on here, the Suzuki Escudo dirt trial car was a monster machine purpose built for this race. Constructed on an aluminum space frame, designed completely from scratch, it was equipped with a fully tuned 2.5 liter twin turbo V6, pushing 981 horsepower with maximum torque of 687.1 pound feet. At 800 kilograms, the Escudo was a featherweight, so to push the car down into the slippery gravel of the course, it was given a massive front spoiler and colossal rear wing that were wind tunnel tested and designed. The base Escudo was lost completely in its transformation into this overwhelming beast. Now flipping over to the legendary car dealership, we can see this car goes for 1.7 million credits. And in the world of grinding nowadays, that is probably going to be around an hour and a half of grinding, depending on which events you decide to do and if you get the clean race bonus. Um, so 1.7 million credits, one and a half hours of grinding, not too, too bad. What I'm really interested in here is the car type on the left. You see where it says racing car, Pikes Peak Midship. Well, um, racing car, that's a good sign. That means it's going to come pre-installed with a lot of the racing upgrades. You're not gonna have to spend a lot of extra credits upgrading the car. Although you will see that there are some opportunities to upgrade it beyond where it currently is. And we'll look at that. Um, but uh, what about the uh, Pikes Peak designation? It's got me really curious. A lot of people are speculating right now about Gran Turismo and how it has the exclusive rights or licensing to the Pikes Peak course and talking about how it's not in the game and we didn't have it in Gran Turismo Sport. Why isn't it in the game? But if you look up here and we go over to car type, um, you can see that there is a Pikes Peak group and you may not have noticed this before or maybe you did, but the um, Audi Quattro was the only Pikes Peak car in that group before and now we also have the Escudo Pikes Peak you know, special blah, blah, blah. So why would we have this different designation for this car, um, for this type of car? There, there's only two cars here. Is it an indicator of what's to come? Is there a possibility that we're going to get the Pikes Peak course in a future release? Um, I don't think it's out of the question and I hope it's something that we can kind of hold on, hold on to hope for. Um, but if we wanna start looking at the car from an aesthetic perspective, looking at um, what we what we think the car looks like from a rating and review perspective that way. Obviously, we know what the outside of this car looks like. It looks awesome. It literally has a sticker on the front that says Monster. It has a tanning bed on the back for a wing. It has a giant toe kick on the front for a front lip. And um, yeah, you know, uh, the car looks amazing. So uh, exterior styling, obviously 10 out of 10. Interior styling, I mean, the car, it's, it's, it's just another race car. Nothing super special there. So I think from an interior styling perspective, hard to give it a 10 out of 10. You know, it's, it's like an eight. It looks good. It looks like a good clean race car, but just a basic race car. Okay, let's go on ahead and look at the spec sheet. Um, we're gonna take a look at what comes stock on the car. So we've got racing hard tires, fully customized racing suspension, fully customizable differential. Um, the car comes with a normal transmission. So the transmission can be upgraded. You can obviously adjust the downforce, obviously with that giant lip and giant wing, obviously. <laughs> um, so a little bit of opportunity for upgrade there, especially with the transmission and customizing that, optimizing it, if you will. Um, looking at some of the performance numbers, so 846 pp, that makes this car a great candidate to be down-tuned for 800 pp races. And I actually already did use this car in the Watkins Glen, the newly released 800 pp event, and it worked great. Um, I did not have to do any kind of elaborate strategy. It's a 200,000 credit event for 10 laps on the long course. And uh, the car worked great, worked really well. So uh, looking at the horsepower, we've got 981 horsepower. 
and 1,764 pounds of curb weight. That gives us a power to weight ratio of about 0.56. That's actually the best power to weight ratio of any car we've reviewed so far. The next runner up is the Ferrari FXXK. That car had a power to weight ratio of 0.4. So this one's 0.56. So that's pretty impressive, but not surprising when you have almost a thousand horsepower in a car that weighs about 750 pounds. To put that in perspective, a Honda CRX the two-seater production car that stopped production in 1991 was one of the lightest weight Hondas ever mass produced and it came in at about 2,100 pounds curb weight. So this, count, this car is about almost 400 pounds lighter than a Honda CRX and has about 10 times the horsepower. So not, um, not uninteresting, if you will. Uh, because it has such high horsepower and it's a turboed car and it has a 2.5 liter engine, you'll find that as you drive this car, all of the power is in the top end. Short shifting this car makes it very slow because it has a lot of turbo lag. So you really got to rev this car out to get the most out of it. And you'll find that out if you try to, again, short shift the car and fuel save with it. Low and high speed stability are both close to negative one. I find those numbers to be crap. The car is very stable and very easy to drive, as you'll see in the demonstration here shortly. But before that, we're gonna go on ahead and flip over to high speed ring, do a couple of drag races, a couple quarter mile pulls, and a couple of high speed runs, see what kind of top speed we're getting out of the 1998 Suzuki Escudo Pikes Peak in Gran Turismo 7. Real quick, before we head into the testing, I do want to just show you what some of the upgrades are available for this car. So you can do steering angle adapter, hydraulic handbrake, obviously tires, nitrous, those are available. Most of the racing upgrades have already been installed, so not a lot that you can install here, except for the fully customizable racing transmission. That is definitely still available, and you'll be able to get a lot out of that with this car. Um, you can change the turbocharger to a high RPM turbocharger. Not sure what that's gonna do to this car, uh, given it's already very much a top-end car. Um, and then, of course, you can add a power restrictor and ballast. Um, but beyond that, you know, the car already has pretty much all of the racing bits installed that you would want to install. Let's go on ahead and flip over to GT Auto. Give us a nice fresh car wash. You got to get a car wash. You know, this car, it's from 1998, has 1,200 miles on it. It's probably been sitting in somebody's shed somewhere. So let's get that grime off, get it looking nice and fresh. And uh, take a look and see what we can do with this car from a customization perspective. You can actually do nothing with this car from a customization perspective. There's no custom parts, racing items, or other parts that are available. You're limited to basically livery editor, wheels, and paint when it comes to customizing this car. And now we're going to go ahead and flip over to special stage redex and do our testing. First things first, we're going to do a couple quarter mile pulls. So we're looking for the 400 meter board here at Special Stage Redex. And uh, immediately after the first pull, we're going to follow this one into a top speed run. And so we're just going to enter our way across the line and see what the timestamp is. So our first pull looks like we got 8.9. And we're just going to verify that. Yep, that big old lip is definitely across the line. So 8.9 seconds, that's pretty good. Let's see what we're able to put down for a top speed and uh, six gears in this car, and uh, we're gonna top out at about 189 miles per hour. Now, we got there really fast. There's a lot of opportunity in this car to tune those gears and make this car uh, quite the top speed beast, especially if you put that top, um, that high-end uh, turbocharger on, top-end turbocharger. Be really curious to see what the performance looks like then. Uh, we're gonna go on ahead with uh, pool number two here, quarter mile, and uh, in the second pool, we are Let's, let's have a look here as we go across the line. It's like 8.75, so that's really good too. Now, I'm actually doing these pulls with TC set to, to set, set to zero. Normally I do it with traction control set to um, one, but because this car is all wheel drive, you can actually, you hook up pretty easy. You don't need TC set to one, you can do it with zero. Uh, but there's more opportunity if you do set it to one. Um, we're doing one more, so we're going to go with best out of three. I actually missed one of my shifts with this run, and it uh, looks like we crossed the line at about nine seconds. So uh, overall, top speed, 189 miles per hour. Best quarter mile, 8.75. So really strong performance in both regards there. 
And we're going to go on ahead and flip over to Watkins Glen here. This is a 10 lap race on the long course. And uh, I'm not going to, not going to by any means uh, take you through the entire race, but just going to give you general impressions of how this car handles on the track in its stock form. I do adjust the differential just a little bit. Um, and obviously I have to play with the fuel maps in order to not have to pit. And this car is 846 PP, I think I said stock. So I had to down tune it to 800 PP. Um, with the racing hard tires, that meant bringing the power down to, I think it was like 70 or 75%. So this car is very heavily down tuned in this race, um, but it just handles so well. And with that tunable differential, you can really control your tire wear. You know, that compared with, um, or combined with your brake balance, you can really control your tire wear. But throughout this 10 lap race, I had no problems with tire wear. Um, I, as far as fuel consumption is concerned, so the car didn't seem bad, but I was really, you know, I'm already short shifting on lap one, adjusting the fuel map to three. Um, and pretty much the entire race, I ran it at fuel map three. But more just, uh, you know, so so I don't know, I don't have a lot to compare it to as far as fuel consumption is concerned, but it, it seemed manageable. Um, but to be honest, I, I don't have a, a huge baseline in that regard. Uh, more about just how the car handles, you know, how it behaves on the track with other cars, um, dirty air, um, you know, oversteer, understeer. This car is extremely stable. It's extremely forgiving. I did some testing with it where, you know, I didn't have the power restricted and it, it's still very, very forgiving. Um, the fact that it is all wheel drive, you know, I think plays a huge part in that. Um, with the exception of basically, who is it? Was it Grady? Tidge, yeah. <laughs> with the exception of Tidgeney, uh, trying to shunt me off the track there. The car is just extremely easy to drive. It's very stable, but it also has pretty, it rotates in pretty well as, as well. So you're gonna see me recover from a few incidents here on the first couple of laps. Um, incidents that, you know, I'm not that familiar with this track. So I've only done a few laps on the long course. Don't really know the braking points very well. And so you're going to see me make a lot of mistakes going around on these first couple of laps and um, the car recovers from them beautifully. You know, like that, you do that in like a Aston Martin DB9, you're going right into the wall. That thing's just gonna oversteer right into the wall. So yeah, um, driving impressions on this car, really good. Um, the car feels great, it's very stable. Honestly, very enjoyable to drive. I feel like this is one of those cars that has a lot of power, but anybody could just like pick it up and drive it. And you still, you know, you can tune the suspension. I haven't tuned it at all. You can tune the gearbox to get more, you know, optimize the power, um, depending on the track. So this car, you know, it is a legendary car for a reason. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm really hoping, I really hope that Gran Turismo and Polyphony really hope that they decide to go on ahead and get the Pikes Peak Hill Climb incorporated into the game in a future release. If they do, I'm going to be really curious if, you know, what version of the Hill Climb they incorporate. Is it going to be the paved version of 2011 Plus? Is it going to be the mixed surface version of the late 90s and early 2000s? Or is it going to be the all dirt version? Um, you know, this is supposed to be the real driving simulator. So that being the case, you would expect it to be, you know, the latest version. It's going to be all tarmac. And that, you know, it would be a shame if that is the case, but I would still enjoy it. I would still drive it. I'd still have fun. Um, but I think that the mixed, uh, mixed surface would, would provide the most challenge and the most enjoyment. Um, it would be basically a course like, like you would expect from one of the dirt games, right? There's a lot of mixed surface, um, mixed surface courses in that game. 
So beyond that guys, just uh, take a look at this car and how it stacks up against some of the other cars in the game. Um, it comes in with an overall rating of 7.9 and uh, that's a really strong rating. It is only outperformed by the Nissan GTR GT500 and really the only reason the GTR outperforms the Pikes Peak Escudo is because it is a GT500 car and can be used in Group 3 races. Whereas the Escudo Pikes Peak is, um, it's just rated as a Pikes Peak car. And so it, you're not gonna be able to just take this thing into a daily race unless it's a special event for Pikes Peak cars or maybe a time trial or something, but you're not gonna be able to use it the majority of the time. So because you're not gonna be able to use it the majority of the time, um, even though the price is fair and manageable, um, it just doesn't have a lot of value uh, compared to some of the other cars that are out there. Now that might change if we uh, you know, find out that you know, the Escudo Pikes Peak course gets released into the game and there's events for it. You know, If there's top dollar events where you can earn a lot of credits, if there's online events where you can get a lot of play time with the car, yeah, then the value is obviously going to go up. But from an overall rating perspective, the GTR GT500 is the only car that outperforms the Escudo Pikes Peak right now. After that, it's the Ferrari FXXK and then the Ferrari P4. And so um, overall, really enjoyable car to drive. Definitely recommend buying it. Um, on the binary scale of smash or pass, this car is definitely a smash. Um, so definitely get this car while it is in the legendary dealership. Uh, we don't know how long it's going to be there and we don't know uh, when it'll be available again next. So if you haven't bought this car yet, get out there, grind the 1.7 million credits that you need to buy it and buy it ASAP. Thank you all so much for watching. I do hope that you enjoyed the video. If you did enjoy the video, please do hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel. And let me know in the comments below what car you'd like to see in a future installment of Smasher Pass.